podido escuchar Nos hemos humillado Para cumplir hoy tu voluntad Por eso hoy declaramos Que venimos a about the Nazis and about the Second World War and how that I, I love watching documentaries on it. Um, I always seem to be uh, moved by that, obviously. I don't know if you know anything about that, about all the tragedies that happened in the Nazi camps. Um, but the story goes that there was a certain camp where the soldiers were, and these were American soldiers um, that had gone over there to fight, and they were captured by the Nazis, and they were behind the enemy lines. And in one of these camps, these prisoners of war, or as you would say, the POWs, the prisoners of war, were there. And like most of the camps, they were super thin. Um, they were exhausted. They were, as you can imagine, depressed. Um, they would cut off all of their hair. You know, they wouldn't give them to eat. They were very, very malnourished, extremely discouraged. And the Nazis would watch them, and, and they would watch them. They would taunt them. They, they would see that most of these, these soldiers, most of these men that were mighty men at one time, they were strong men at one time, were very thin, were very frail. They wouldn't even speak to each other. Even though they might be, you know, friends, there was not much conversation going on. But one day, these uh, soldiers got up and saw that the POWs were all of a sudden talking. They were all of a sudden, uh, uh, you know, in little circles having conversations. There was actually smiles on their faces. And, and they were like, they were still behind the fences. They were still prisoners of war. They were still not fed. They're like, wait a minute, did somebody give them a pizza or something? You know, what, what, what happened here? They were still mal malnourished. They were still super weak. They were still super sick. But the guards noticed that something in that camp had changed. Turned to your neighbor and said, what changed? Yes, because they were smiling now. They were talking to each other. They were huddling. And the guards had no idea what had gone on. And what had happened, as the story tells, is that somebody had smuggled in a small transistor radio. And in this radio, the POWs, the American POWs, had heard that the Allied forces had landed, that they were on their way that the rescuers were on their way, that they were just days away from being rescued. The Allied forces had overthrown the Nazis, and liberation was on its way. Although the lock of that fence was still locked, right? The fence was still closed. The soldiers hadn't been fed. They hadn't been given food. But they knew that they were free. There's something here. They were behind the fences, but they knew they were free because they had heard the good news. Say the good news. You know that good news awakens hope? Did you know that? That good news awakens hope in us? That them hearing that the allied forces were on their way had already brought freedom to their hearts. And I come this morning to give you the good news of Jesus Christ. You might feel like you are behind the enemy lines. You might feel like the devil still has a hold of something. You might not see that the gate of that fence is opened yet. You might feel like you are still behind the fence. You might feel malnourished and weak. But let me tell you the good news of Jesus Christ. And the good news is that he died on that cross. But he didn't just die. He resurrected. We have a Savior that paid the price for each one of us. And you are free. You are free. And you know the devil is a liar. He is a liar and he comes to rob, to steal, and to kill. And this week I saw it I, and, and, and it came to us to do this healing service. It actually came to my husband and I, I was all on board. 
You know, we've been suffering through through sickness. Let me tell you, I got my results back. I've, I've been dealing with the pain on my side. I got my MRI back. I got my mammogram back. I got my blood test back. And they said, there is no, there's no cancer. There's no lumps. There's nothing in my body. I am free of that. And that is good news. That is good news and great. But what happened in the process of the waiting? What was going on with me? And you know what? You might still be waiting. You might still be behind. And you might still feel like you are behind enemy lines. But Jesus Christ is our good news. There's nothing else I can preach to you that's not Jesus Christ. There is no other message that is not the message of Jesus Christ. And this, there was an angel that I've been talking about for a couple of weeks now. I just can't get past the story of this angel. And this angel appears to Mary, and he appears to give her good news. He appears to her on, 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 on one day, and he says this. He says, fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be to all the people. Say, all the people. So this is news for you. Say, neighbor, this is for you. Yes, this news is for you. And he said this, for unto you. We, when I read this, you know, I think that he's telling Mary. But right before that, he says that this is good news for who? For all people. So say, neighbor, this is news for you. Yes, this is for you. And it says, for unto you. Unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. This Savior is for you. It's not just for Mary. This message wasn't just for some, some shepherds. This message wasn't just for, you know, for someone, for some chosen one. This is for all people and that Christ the Lord was born. Say Christ the Lord in that manger. This should be good news that in that manger, our Savior was born on that Christmas day. Christ the Lord is our hope, our only hope, and that is the message that we preach in this place. It was birthed through Mary, but it was actually birthed through our Lord and our God. This should awaken good news in your heart and not condemnation. You know, John 3, 17 to 18 says this, For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned. Turn to your neighbor and say, Neighbor, you are not a cockroach. <laughs> You're like, Pastor, what was that all about? Do you know some of us feel like we are cockroaches? You feel like you are just the you are at the bottom of the pit. And you come and you came to church and you were, you know, and you got invited by your Christian friend. You know, by by the Christian. But you're the outcast, right? So you're the cockroach coming with the Christian. You know, you're the you're the big sinner. You know, you you wear the scarlet letter and and you're just hoping, well, I'll come, maybe. No, this message is not just for your Christian friend. This message is for all people. The, the message is that Jesus Christ came to bring freedom to all people. Can someone say, thank you, Jesus? And he didn't come to condemn you. He didn't come to signal you out. He came to make you free. He came to break the bondage. He came to break those chains. He came to open up that door, that fence of your prison. Yes, it's true that Jesus Christ was born in Bethlehem. It is true that in that moment, in that manger, on that night, the word became flesh. The word of God became flesh. When you think of Christmas, you think of a baby being born, correct? We think of Christmas, we think of Easter, we think of Jesus and the cross and the resurrection. In Christmas, we think of a baby being born. When you think of a baby, you think of something new, of a new beginning. The baby born in Bethlehem was the beginning. The beginning of the incarnate God in human form. God, man, Jesus Christ. But Christ the Lord who came into the world in human form did not begin in Bethlehem. And let me just tell you that he did not begin there. That was not the beginning of his story. Jesus Christ was always. It's just in him in human form was there in that manger. The beginning of his life on earth of the one who has no beginning. In that manger... That's where his life began on earth. But he has no beginning. He is our God. John 8, 51 to 59 says this. Very truly, I tell you, 
Whoever obeys my word will never see death. This is Jesus talking. The Jews said to him, now we know that you have a demon, they told Jesus. Abraham died and the prophets also. And you say if anyone keeps my word, he shall never taste of death. So this is Jesus talking to the Jews now. He's older. And he's saying that if they believe in him, they will never see death. That same baby that was born in that manger had grown and now is saying these words. And verse 53 says this, Surely you are not greater than our father Abraham who died. The prophets died too. Whom do you make yourself out to be? And that's, that's the whole point of my message. Who is this Jesus? Why, why, do we, why do we call ourselves Christians? Who is that baby born in that manger? And he's telling them, he says this, Jesus answered, if I glorify myself, my glory is nothing. It is my Father who glorifies me, of whom you say he is our God. And you have not come to know him, but I know him. And if I say that I do not know him, I shall be a liar like you. But I do know him and keep his word. Your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day, and he saw it and was glad. The Jews therefore said to him, you are not yet 50 years old, and you have seen Abraham? So they're, com they're like saying, they're having this conversation, you guys. Jesus is saying that, that Abraham knew him. But they're like, you're not even 50. In that sense, in that context in the Bible, when somebody used 50, it may, meant coming into maturity. So it's not really that they were saying his age, just in that culture, when they said, oh, yeah, he's more than 50. Like, 50 was that point of reference where now he's a mature person. He's no longer a child. You know, he's no longer a, a young adult. He's a mature. So they're like, you're not even 50. And Jesus said to them in verse 58, truly, truly, I say to you, before Abraham was born, what does he say there? I am. Let's say it again. So before Abraham was born, what does it say? I am. Okay, there's just something wrong there, right? That, that just doesn't make sense. Before Abraham was born, I am? Verse 59, therefore they picked up stones to throw at him. But Jesus hid himself and went out of the temple. What do you mean, they asked him, that Abraham saw you? How could you ever make us believe that you saw Abraham who had been dead for more than a millennia? And the Lord's response, our Jesus responded with that. Truly, truly, I say, before Abraham was born, I am. What a statement. I am. What a claim. I am. Jesus, that Jesus born in the manger, the Jesus that we say is our Savior. But what was he saying to them? He said, I am. That's the eternal present that indicates no beginning. I am. There's no beginning. There's no end to that statement. I am. The statement was born. In its original version would be read before Abraham became. In that verse when it said before Abraham was born, it would have said in the original before Abraham became. Because there was a time where he became. There was a time where he was born, where his, where his um, life started. But Jesus, there was no time. He just is. He always is. To become is to pass from nothingness and non-existence to existence. But I am, I am denotes a model of existence which is not due to any transition. It is a statement of eternality. It is a statement of everlasting life. No beginning and no end. Just always and forever will be. I don't know about you, church, but it's hard for me to understand this concept about God being, just always being. You know what I'm like, but even before this? But how about before this? But like, who made? It's just you can't wrap your brain around it. Psalms 90, 1 to 2 says this, Lord, you have been our dwelling place throughout all generations. Before the mountains were born, or you brought forth the whole world from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. I love that statement. From everlasting to everlasting, you are God. Jesus says, and I am the eternal existence 
I'm sorry, then I am the eternal existing one who eternally existed, whereas Abraham at some point began. But I know him, and I know the prophets, and I was here even before the world was made. This phrase, before Abraham was, I am, harbors within it the most profound claim. Jesus here in that moment was making the most profound claim, church. And I want to bring it to you because many times we get lost in the Christmas story and we, we, we talk about the Jesus in the manger. But what did that indicate? Why? Why did, why did the Pharaoh want to kill all the young boys? What was the danger of Jesus? What was the danger of him being born and, and growing up? He, Jesus, the son of a carpenter, was claiming to be the eternal one the timeless one, the God who was from everlasting to everlasting. And Jesus Christ, time and eternity meet. When Jesus was born, time and eternity meet. The writer of Hebrews 1, 1 to 3 says this, In the past God spoke to our forefathers through the prophets, at many times in various ways. But in these last days, he had spoken to us by who? By his Son whom he appointed heir of all things, and through whom he made the universe. The sun is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being, sustaining all things by his powerful word. After he had provided purification of sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty in heaven. Paul makes this remarkable statement in Colossians 1, 15 to 17, he says this, He, Jesus, is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. It is so important that we understand that Jesus is our God, that it is God our Father, Jesus the Son, and the Holy Spirit, that we believe in the Trinity. There is power in that. There is power in the church that believes in the power of the Holy Spirit. There is power in a church that understands why Jesus Christ is so important. There is power in a church that understands that there is a Father that they can come to, that they can ask. And that is why this message is so important. Because he says, he, Jesus, is the image. Is the image birthed there in that manger was the image of the invisible God. The firstborn over all creation. For by him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things were created by him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. In who? In Jesus Christ. Do you feel like things are falling apart? I got you the answer. In him all things hold together. In who? In Jesus Christ, in Jesus' name, I declare that all that chaos, all of that sickness, all of the bondage, anything that you're feeling, that uneasiness, in the name of Jesus, we declare that he holds all things together and for it be for his glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Jesus, come on, church. Come on. I'm teaching this morning. I'm teaching. I want to teach you what the Bible says. It says, Jesus, the I am. Say with me, the I am. In Exodus chapter 3, God has manifested himself to Moses. So I just jumped from the beginning of the gospel where it talks about the birth of Jesus. I went to where he was in his prime, his three years of where he was working, you know, his 30, 33 years old. And he's talking to them saying he is the I am. Now I'm going back to the Old Testament. Let's go and see where this comes from. In Exodus chapter 3, God has manifested himself to Moses, and he says this in Exodus 3, 1 to 3. Now Moses was tending the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian. And he led the flock to the far side of the wilderness. He came to Horeb, the mountain of God. Say, the mountain of God. There the angel, another angel. Oh, my gosh, these angels are just announcing good news all over the place, right, you guys? The angel of the Lord appeared to him in flames of fire from within a bush. Say a bush. A bush. A burning bush. You guys, if it wasn't crazy enough that an angel appeared to Mary and said that a virgin is going to become pregnant. Now, how about this one? A bush in the desert was burning. 
that should be almost as shocking as that announcement. Moses saw that. Though the bush was on fire, it did not burn up. It was on fire, but it wasn't consuming itself. So Moses thought, I'll go over and see this strange sight. Why the bush doesn't burn up? What was he thinking? Do you know those horror movies where you start hearing the music and it's like they hear a sound and it's like, don't know. I don't even know how to do it. I'm not a musician. But you know that music that's like suspense? And then the girl, she's in her pajamas without any shoes. And she goes out to see to see what's making that noise outside. And I'm always like, run! What are you thinking? Close the door. Get in the closet. Get a bat. But no, they always have to go out, right? I'm like, what are they thinking? Well, when I read the story, I'm like, Moses, what are you thinking? You're, you're seeing this burning bush in the desert. Like, what are you thinking going towards that burning bush? But he went. I don't know about you, but I, I would not have walked towards that burning bush. But he's like, I'm going to walk over. I don't care, you know, wh- why or whatever's going on. I just want to see what's, what's going on here. So I don't know about you, but I would not have done that. I don't care why it's burning. I don't know what, want to know why or who's making it burn. I'm just like, I'm running away. I'm going the other way. But... Thank God Moses is not me. It says in verse 4, when the Lord saw that he had gone over to look, God called to him from within the bush, and he said, Moses, Moses. And Moses said, here I am. Here's that word that we started from the beginning of the year, here I am, making yourself available. Moses said, here I am. Here I am, Lord. Somebody's calling me Moses, Moses. This is God calling me. Here I am. And there in front of that burning bush, God commissioned Moses to lead approximately two million or so Jews out of Egypt, out of Pharaoh's control, out of their bondage, out of the slavery, and lead them out to the promised land. Moses replied, behold, in verse 13, I'm going to the sons of Israel, and I shall say to them, the God of your fathers has sent me to you. Now they may say to me, what is his name? What shall I say to them? So here we go again with this name of Jesus, and and it's God in this instance, but you're going to see where I'm going to make the connection. So he says to him, "Who? okay, I'm going to tell these people, I'm going to lead you, but I'm leading you. Don't think I'm crazy. Don't think I'm wacko. You guys need to follow me because your God has told me to come. And when they ask me, they're going to say, what is his name? Because there was many gods. There was the God of the sun, the God of the moon, the God of fertility. There's so many gods that are like, What God sent you, give us his name. And he says, what shall I say to them? Verse 14, God says to Moses, I am who I am. This is what you are to say to the Israelites. I am has sent me to you. Say, I am. I am. Again, the I am. There is so much significance in the name and understanding this complexity. The depth, the richness of this name so crucial for us as Christians. Adams named his wife Eve because she was the mother of all things living. God changed Abram's name to Abraham to show that he had made him the father of many nations. But he says, not I was. He didn't say I will be. But he says, I am. I am. Eternal God. Ever present. When you think of I am, I think this is the message that is most preached in churches about God's existence, about his eternal living, about his continually eternal presence, tense, now, he always is. God is no before, no after, no past, no future. He just always is in every moment. He's continual, continuous existence eternally. He's all bound up in the I am. But that's not all, you guys. And I feel like that's where we get caught up in that name, I am. We think, oh, great, God is eternal, eternally always existent, which is awesome because that means he's in every moment of every one of your lives. He'll be there for you and he'll be there for your generations. He will still be our God, and that's awesome. But give me something more. And I said, what is there? Why did he say, I am who I am? Why did he repeat himself? Because that's not all. Go back to verse 11 for a moment. Moses says to God, who am I that I should go to the Pharaoh and say I should bring the sons of Israel out of Egypt? Who am I, Lord? Look at me. I stutter. Look at me. I I ran away. You know, I was born a Jew, and then I, I, I grew up with the Egyptians. 
what he really is telling God is, Lord, you're overestimating my ability. Who am I to be able to accomplish such a big task? In verse 12, it says this, and he said, certainly I will be with you. This is, this is my point here. He says this, certainly I will be with you, and this shall be the sign to you that it is I who have sent you. This is my point. Church, church, please get it. Not only is God saying I'm eternal, I'm always present, but I'm present for you. I am with you. The I am is more complex, is more, has more depth has more meat on it, is juicier than just God is always existing. But he's existing and he's present for you. He's present for you. His eyes see you. His ears hear you. He acknowledges. He is aware of your situation. So yes, he is the eternal God. He's ever present. But now we learned a second thing about I am. And this is my point, this is my closing, and this is my entire message. I am is the eternal one who is present with his people. I don't know about you, but I need that God. Like, you can preach me how powerful and how mighty God is, but I need him to show up for me. You know, I've had that type of year where I'm like, Lord, I preach you. I teach about you. I believe in you, but I need you to show up in my life. I need you to be the one that stands up in the middle of the battle. I need to be able to, to go to your skirts, to, to go underneath your wing, to feel your warmth. I am, not in the distant sense, I am in the near sense, God says. What good is it for me to serve a God that is just eternally present, but is not present for me? What good is it for us to fear God, but but a God that we can understand that he's there for me. I am the eternal living one who is present with his people. I will be with you, says the Lord. Go down to verse 17. It says this, and I have promised to bring you up out of your misery in Egypt into the land of the Canaanites. He says he is present. I want to go back. I don't even have it here, but it just, I want to pause. I, I'm not even going to go to my third point. It just came to me this story when Elijah was running and we've been using that a lot pastor actually preached about it pastor David preached about it last week as well and that just came to me right now as I'm I'm talking about God being present I just feel such a burden in my heart for you to be aware of that in the I am when he says I am who I am he's telling you, you not only am I am present in all time but I am the I am I am present for you and I remember Elijah, and he was running from Jezebel, and he was running, and he was fearing for his life, and he was going through a depression. And, and yes, he got up and he ate, but then yet he was taking shelter in a cave. And he got brought out, and he saw, he saw a wind, and there was a strong wind. And he looked for God in that wind. He looked. He's like, he must be in the wind. And the wind blew strongly, and, and you know, that's how we are. We're like, oh, he must be there. He must be in that. But he wasn't. And then it says that the earth shook, that there was a shaking in the earth, and things fell, and things were, you know, sh shaking, and he's like, God must be in that shaking, in that earthquake. He's like, God, are you in that shaking? He said, no, I'm not there. And then he felt a fire. Oh, wow, it must be just like Moses. He would have thought just like Moses in the burning bush, he must be in the fire, he must be in the warmth, and the heat, in the burning. And he looked for him. He said, I'm not there either. And then there was a gentle breeze. There was a whisper. In my heart, the message that I wanted to bring to you, church, was this Christmas, more than the lights and the show, and that's awesome, have the parties. But you know what has brought you, what, what, what has come, who has come for you has been someone, a God, that doesn't just speak to the masses with a microphone. But if you would listen, he wants to speak to you. He has something to say. There is a message in that gentle whisper. There's a message for you. There, there's a message for Laura and for Daryl. There is a message for your generations. 
There's a purpose why God brought you here. There's even a purpose in it. He's going to use everything that you have gone together as a couple. And in, as a family in your mother's sickness. And now in her healing in the name of Jesus. But you know, I don't just believe, Laura and Daryl, that, that this message is just a general message. I believe that we serve a God that in your intimate time, there's a message for you and for your family for your future grandchildren that you might seem like are so far away, but you're going to remember this crazy lady that's talking to you. For generations of children and grandchildren that are going to love God and fear God and serve God. You will see your generations lifting up the name of Jesus. And for everything that you have served in the places that you might seem, I'm not doing much. You might think, oh, I only do this. But you know those texts in the morning, Laura, that you say, Pastor, would you like coffee? God's the one that's going to give you all, all of that back. He's going to give it to you and your children and all of those details, all of that love in which you both serve. God is there and he's in the whisper. You know, he's not in the wind. You know, he wasn't in the earthquake. You know, he wasn't in the fire. And I say, why? Because I want you to be close. Because a whisper, you have to be close. you got to get close this Christmas. Remember that, that baby that was born, the message that he's giving is, I come for you. I came for you. You are not that cockroach. You are not the Christian's friend. You are not just coming. I've called you. Turn to your neighbor and said, he's called you. He has a word for you. He loves you. His, he died on that cross for you. If you believe that church, stand to your feet and let's finish this time just worshiping him. Para cumplir hoy tu voluntad.